Hello and welcome to episode 8 of My Doll's House Diary. Now in this episode I want to get the kitchen ready to the moving in stage so all of the fixtures and fittings in place and ready for moving in the furniture and the accessories. So it's taken me a little bit longer than I'd hoped as I was waiting for a ceiling light to be delivered. Um, until I had that I couldn't fit the beams so that's now arrived as you can see and I've made a start on the beams. But up until that stage I had got quite a bit done so I'll start by showing you what I've already done and then we'll carry on with those beams. Okay, so I'm making a start on the beams um, for the kitchen and this is actually my second time of doing it. This morning I started out using a 3mm thick sheet um, and I cut some beams all the same thickness. When I'd actually um, sort of stuck them into place using masking tape I didn't really like how they looked so I decided to start again did a little bit more research online and found a picture of some beams that I really liked so I'm going to copy those so my idea is I have one thick beam down the center here and that will measure 25 millimeters across so an inch across and then I'll have several um, thinner beams go in in the opposite direction all the way along. So I've just done three thinner ones to start out with now because I wanted to get this in the right position um, across the centre so I could make a little mark um, for the light fitting. I don't know if you can see that there but what I did was I made a little bit of pencil on each of the eyelets and then pressed this piece of wood against it and you can just see it's just made a little pattern and actually the eyelets aren't exactly central to the ceiling. It doesn't really matter as long as this beam is central. If I've got that lined up at the back there. So that will go like that. I'm going to box out this beam so it will be eight and a half millimeters deep. So it will come just below these um, side beams which are six millimeters or quarter of an inch. So I'll go and box out this beam and then I want to try and do it, obviously so the side beams um, are mirrored on this side, but I, just to make it look even from when you're looking in, I want to do one right in the centre of the chimney breast there. Okay, so what I've done here is make a template of half of the ceiling, or, or a quarter rather. So this is that central beam, so that's enabled me now to divide out the remaining beams so there's an equal gap between each. And then what I've done is using three millimeter sheet wood, I've cut some spacers. So I'll put the back beam in place and then I'll put that there and I can do the next beam, so on and so on. Okay, so I've cut all of the beams that I need for that right hand side. So what I'm gonna do now is use my spacer to come along this way um, and just put the beams into place with a bit of masking tape. But I've tried doing this a couple of times and my big head is just in the way of the camera so I'll just do it and then show you the result. Okay so that's the right hand side beams all in place. Now I'll start the left hand side and there's the left hand side done and I think that looks so much better than the wider beams I was using. So I had a thought that that hole for the light fit in I think once that beam is in place that's going to be terribly difficult to get the um, wires into the holes. So what I think I might do is age these all up and have them ready but order myself a light fitting and I'm thinking of getting something in black that looks like a sort of black iron light fitting. So I'll have a search round for one of those and then as soon as that comes then I'll fit the beams and they'll be ready to fit. Okay so it's now gone five. Time to get the dinner on, so I'll see you again hopefully tomorrow. Okay, so here are all of my beams and I'm going to finish them using a dark oak wood die. But first of all, I want to age them up a bit and I'm going to start by using a screwdriver. And similar um, to what I did on the um, chimney breasts around and the door, if you saw those tutorials, I'm just going to start with this screwdriver and just sort of go along the edges, sort of scrape in a little bit of the wood away here and there, making a few sort of knocks and bumps. 
but I only want to do that on these sort of three sides. I want to keep the edge that's going to be stuck to the ceiling nice and flat and straight so that it will stick on nicely. So I don't want any of these little bits hanging up so once I've sort of used the screwdriver to make some knocks and dents and what have you I'll give them a quick sand and then I'll show you how I'm going to finish those off. Put some knocks in on the side as well. So that's one started. This could take a while. Okay, so I think I've done as much damage as I can with the screwdriver. So as you can see, there's lots of bits of wood hanging off. And I've just really tried to round off all of these sort of corners along this, what will be the bottom edge once the beam is in place. And then I've just done some scoring along the sides. So now I'm going to use a medium grade sandpaper, and this is 180 grade, just to sand and get rid of all those bits that are hanging off. And I'm just doing it really roughly because I don't want to smooth them too much. Okay, so each piece has now been roughly sanded and I just want to finish them off with this wire brush and I've got a set of these brushes and this is the harshest one in the set and what this does is create um, a grain in the wood. Now I've started this piece but I'm not sure if you can see that on camera. Yes, I think you can just there. So I'll show you the technique I use. I sort of go along in circular motions and then I drag the brush back along the wood and you can see that creates some really nice patterns in there and that will look like grain in the wood. So I'm now going to do that on each piece and then they'll be ready for finishing. Okay, so the beams are now ready for staining and I'm going to be using this dark oak Rustin's wood dye and after giving that a good shake, I've dispensed some here into this little pot That's so I just don't have to keep dipping the brush back into the tin and I've got some kitchen towel squares here already torn off so that as soon as I've put the dye on I can wipe it off again and that's just because I don't want it to dry to the darkest colour make a start. And I think actually because this is quite a big beam I'm going to start dabbing that off as I go along. As well, where's, where I haven't um, removed the glue from along the joins, it's the dye isn't taken over it but it's actually given a really nice effect. Okay, so that's the first sheet done. Now on to the second lot. Okay, so the wood dyeing is all done now, and I've transferred all of the beams 
onto this old plastic tray which I use as a bit of a desk extension really and I'll leave them there to dry and I just wanted to show you that larger beam and first of all the marks that I made in it with the wire brush now the wood dies on you, you can see them really clearly and that really does make it look like an old worn beam okay so these are practically um, touch dry now anyway but I'll, I'll leave those for a little bit longer and then it's just a question of keeping them somewhere safe until I get the um, kitchen light and then we can get that all fitted and I think they're going to look really nice okay on to the next bit so today I'm going to be spray painting the Arga and I'm going to start by preparing it. So I want to start by dismantling it. So I'll remove the doors. And then these have got little tiny screws in them. So I'm going to remove the screws and I'm actually going to leave those here. I'm going down to my husband's workshop to spray paint it. only actually got one screw in it so I must have lost that somewhere Let's see if I can find something else to go in there so that's that and then finally there's a piece just in the back there and did I glue that in yeah I actually glued that into place so that's okay that can stay in there and then the other thing I've got a little bit of tacky wax on here where I've um, had tea towels hanging over there and I've just glued them down so I'm gonna have to go and wash that off and a little bit here what that I've used to try and keep the door closed. So I'm actually going to go and remove that with um, warm soapy water and you need to make sure that um, all surfaces are completely clean when you're spray painting otherwise the spray paint won't adhere to the surface. So I'll go and do that. Okay so the tacky wax now is all washed off and I've dried this off on a piece of kitchen towel and now what I need to do is called keying up the surface and that's just to give the um, paint a slightly rougher surface to adhere to so to do that I'm using a 500 grade sandpaper which is quite gentle I'm not trying to take off the paint or anything I just want to go all over the surface and you can see there, it's sort of taken away that shiny layer. Okay, so that's everything keyed up, including the plate covers and the doors. So I'm going to be spraying the entire thing in black, and then I'll be touching back in all the little silver details um, by hand, using a lovely silver metallic paint I've got. But we'll be doing that a lot later, once the spray paint has completely dried. So what I want to do now is just brush this off, to get rid of all the dust. Okay, so let's head off down to my husband's workshop. So my husband has very kindly lent me a corner of his workshop so that I can spray paint my Arga, so thank you for that Matt. And he's masked it all off for me using this brown paper so that I don't get paint everywhere. And I'm going to be using this satin black spray paint which I got from Halfords and it's actually a car spray paint. And before you use it you need to give it a really good shake. And for safety, I'm going to be wearing my mask and goggles and also these um, latex gloves. And it recommends on here that you use a grey primer, but as I've already given the Argon coat of paint, I'll use that as the primer coat. So I'm going to get my safety gear on. So 
I just want to give the pieces several light coats of paint and when I start I always like to do a spray first just onto the paper because it comes out quite heavy at first. Okay, so that's the first light coat and then I need to leave it 15 minutes between coats to dry before applying the next coat. So I think I'll go and have a cup of tea. So that's the first coat now dry and I've given the paint another good shake and now I'm going to apply the second coat. Okay, so that's the second coat dried, and I'm not going to do a third coat on the underside of these doors, so I'm going to do the first coat now on those. And with this coat, I really want to cover all of those little blue um, bits you can still um, see, especially around all these little detailed mouldings. So, give my paint a shake, and then we'll go again. Right, and that's the third and final coat now done. And what I've done is just using the torch on my phone, I've highlighted all the areas there, and that way you can see if you've missed anything. And I'm actually really pleased with the coverage. So I'm now going to leave this to dry, and then once that has completely dried, I can touch in all the little details using my silver paint and small paintbrush. And there is the painted Arga. Now the paint has completely dried. I did the spray painting on Saturday and it's now Monday. So I just left that over the weekend. And you can see in that sunshine the lovely finish on there. Now I used a satin paint. You could use a gloss um, if you wanted to. It's just preference really. I didn't really want that sort of bright shine. I just wanted this sort of sheen. Especially with using black. It would have looked sort of really, really bright and probably the gloss would have looked out of scale. So my next job is to pick out all the little details. You can see on there the word Arga and there's like the little um, temperature gauge, a little fan down here, some screws up here. And then, um, actually, I think this is the temperature gauge along the top here. I don't have an Arga in real life. I would love one. So I'm not really sure what all these bits are, but I'm going to pick out all those in silver and then on the plates here, which aren't actually fixed yet, I've just laid them on there, the handle. And then because it's black on black, I want to do this area around here in silver just to make those stand out a bit. OK, so for the silver paint, I'm going to be using a humbral enamel and it's a metallic silver. And I've also got these small um, brushes, these are detailing brushes in sizes 0, 1 and 2 and the lower number being the finest. So I'm going to be using those to apply the silver paint. So let's get on with that now. OK, so I've given the tin a good shake. And then it's really important to give it a stir as well. And especially with these metallic colours, the sort of element in them that makes the, the shine, I suppose, can tend to sort of sink to the bottom. And even as I'm stirring that, I hope you can see on camera because that sun's just come out again. It makes it look awfully dark. But even as I'm stirring, you can see the silver 
come into the top and that's the colour that we want. I'm using the cocktail sticks, it's obviously just a really small tin and get it right into the um, sort of edges of the tin down there that's where all the sort of sediment um, sits. Okay so I've given that a good stir and I'm just going to lay this sort of prop it up on this tin Make sure your surface is dust free and I've already given this a wipe over. And also what I've got here is a, just a piece of spare wood and I'm going to dip the paint into the, sorry the brush into the paint and then I'm just twisting it on here to make the end of the brush into more of a point. And when you're working on something like this, always sort of work from top to bottom because then you're, you're not sort of leaning in the paint that you've just applied. And I'm just going to start with those little screws. And I'm not going around the outside of that because that is sort of raised, but I'm just doing the top of it. Again, it's not very nice light in my workshop today, so I hope you can see what I'm doing there. Do the next one. So I'm just using tiny little strokes, and you don't need to apply too much paint at once. You can just put a little bit on and then go over it again. And once there's paint there, it's easier to sort of apply paint on top of the paint, if you see what I mean, rather than fresh onto the, the raised letters. And as well, I'm just letting the very, very tip of the brush touch the letter in. And if you find it goes a little bit thick like it did there on that sweep up there, it means you're pressing a little bit too hard so just sort of let up on the pressure. And another good tip is to have a cocktail stick handy, just in case you go over a little tiny bit. You can just pick that off with a cocktail stick and you'll have a few seconds before it's sort of there permanently. And the other thing as well is, as your paint sort of sitting on the desk, it the sediment will start sinking to the bottom again so give it a sort of regular stir make sure all that silver is at the top okay now for the sort of ring around the outside of the wording entirely happy with the ring around the word in there. It's not as sort of sharp as I would have liked but the trouble is it wasn't as raised up as the letters. It was almost just like sort of painting freehand onto a sort of flat, flatter surface. But I don't want to mess around with it too much. I've already tried to remove a little bit at the top of the ring there and I've sort of made a little bit of a smudge but I'm hoping when that's in place you won't be able to see it very clearly. Now you can see it if I put the light on there. Do you see that smudge at the top of the G? It'll sort of tend to disappear if I angle it a bit. So 
I may have to touch that in with a little bit of black um, paint, but we'll see when it dries. Okay, I'll give the paint another stir and carry on. Okay, so I've got another little screw there. Lay that down again. It's a bit heavy there, but luckily it was still in the right place. It's just a question of taking your time. A little tiny bit at a time. And on these raised areas as well, it seems a lot easier. It's sort of almost as if it takes the paint off of the brush. Like on that flat area, it was a lot more difficult. There's a little triangle area down here which I'll do in silver. Okay, so I think I'm done on the front there now. I was debating whether to do this sort of little hood bit that sticks out down here but I don't think I will. I think that would be a bit too much. So I'll leave that like that. Now I'm going to start on the plate covers. So I made a little bit of a mistake with the hot plate covers and I went all the way round including these handles um, using the silver and onto this back bit. It's a little bit carried away but I didn't actually want these handles to be silver as I want this sort of little um, handle bit at the front um, to stand out because I like that bit. So I just went over again using some black paint um, to sort of correct what I'd done and I'm not sure about the result but I'll, I'll have to wait now until it's dry anyway um, and then try them in place and see how it looks and I think they sort of look okay I wanted the silver band around the outside of the hot plate so that it stands out um, from the actual top of the arga, which is obviously black so I'll see how they look on there once the paint has dried so I'm, I'm done for now, and then once it's dried I'll, I'll put it all back together and we'll try it in place and see how it looks. Okay, so there's the completed arga. And this uh, silver paint is completely dry now, that's been dry in overnight. And I think that looks okay. The little pin that I was missing I've replaced there with a dressmaking pin. I'll just put a little bit of glue on there and, and popped that in. They open like that and then I've trimmed the flue down a little bit and that will go in there but I'm not going to glue that into place yet because I'm not sure um, of the angle the, the height that I've got um, underneath the chimney breast so I don't want to glue that in and then not be able to get the argo in place so I'll pop it in place first and then this door here I still can't get it to close flush so I think what I'm going to do is try and find um, a battery operated LED bulb to go in there um, to look like a little glowing um, fire and just have that slightly open. Okay, so let's go and pop this in place and see how it looks. So there is the Arga in place. I think that looks really nice in there. So I'm just going to glue the flue into place like that okay 
so my next job is to fit the skirting boards along this left hand wall. So I'm going to go all the way along the brick here, up to the surround, all the way under the window, just up to that left hand side of the door there. And then once I've got my units in place on the right hand side, I can finish off the skirting by attaching it to any exposed areas of wall. And that's just so that my units will sit flush back against the walls in there. So that's always something worth considering when you're fitting skirting boards. OK, so I'm going to be cutting mitre joins into the skirting board for where they each sort of meet in the corners. And I'm using a mitre block and this is designed to sit over the edge um, of a work surface but I can't get the camera in the right angle so I'm just propping that up there with a rubber like that and I'm also using this razor saw so let me come round the camera like that this piece will be for the first brick wall on that left hand side of the kitchen so I know I'll need the mitre join obviously in this end and go in that way so put it into the mitre block and when you're cutting quite thin strips of wood hold it as close as you can to the sort of slot otherwise it will move about too much and you won't get a straight cut I just want to take this now into the kitchen and measure it up. OK, so that piece will sit there with the mitre join that I made going into that corner. So I'll just put it into place. And I just want to do a pencil mark at this end where I need to do the straight cut. So I'll just press that paper back. I want it to be on the inside of that. just do a little line there and that will be my straight edge and I'll cut that piece as well in the mitre block so just line up the little pencil mark you've made along the straight um, slot along the center and I've laid it down on its flat edge just because it's easier to cut that way so that's my first piece and then I'm going to need another piece with a mitre angle. And if you had a top edge on here, you'd have to do it the opposite way round. But as both of my edges are straight, I'm going to be beveling them afterwards. I can just do it the same way around. Like that. And then those two pieces will join together like that in that first corner. So now I'll go and fit those and make the measurement for the next mitre cut. So I'll put that first piece back into place and then this piece will go along there like that. So now I need to make a pencil mark where the next mitre will begin. So it's just going to be alongside the edge of the chimney breast there. And then there'll just be a tiny little piece of skirting butting up against the surround there. So when I'm measuring up um, to do mitre joints, I always just like to do a little mark to remind me which way the mitre will need to go. So on this piece, it's going to be at the same angle as the piece there, as the cut I did at the first edge of the wood. So I just like to do a little mark like that to remind me when I get back to my desk which angle I need to cut. So I'll go and do that now. And you want to make sure that the blade of your saw is right on the little line that you drew so right at the end of that line otherwise you'll be going um, too far back like that 
and then that tiny little piece that I need to go um, alongside the chimney breast I can create out of this piece I've just cut off and I've already got the mitre there. So again put the double ended piece back into place there like that and then that piece will go along there and I'm just sort of lining it up in front in fact I can use that piece to make sure the two pieces are straight like that and then I can make my pencil mark again so I know where I need to do that straight cut across there try that piece in there and that piece will go there so there's the first little corner done so it's just a question of working your way around cutting your mitre join measuring the next piece and so on and so on my next sort of bit to do will be that back corner so it's going to be quite tricky getting in there so it'll be a question of sort of feeling your way around Last tiny little piece goes into place there and then what I like to do before I remove it for painting is just to write um, numbers on the back so the first piece over here will become um, piece number one number two number three and so on so I just write that on the back of each piece and just make sure that you're always writing on the back of each piece as well and that last little piece there has fallen below the um, floor tiles but when, when I stick that into place obviously I'll stick it above that gap and that becomes number seven Okay, so I've got all my pieces here, all nicely numbered, and now I want to begin beveling the top ed edge of each piece. So, to make sure I know which is the top edge, take the first piece, I knew that went along that first um, piece of brick wall on that left hand side of the kitchen, so I know that the straight edge is the left hand edge, and this will be the right hand edge, so I know this is my top edge along here so just make sure before you start beveling that you've got the right edge and then to make the bevel have a piece of sandpaper on your work surface hold the skirt in at a 45 degree angle against the sandpaper and just sweep it towards you you can see there that's already starting to bevel off I'll just do that a few more times and then to make sure I've got a nice even bevel, I like to just finish that off with a piece of finer grade sandpaper, just in my hand. Take away any rough edges and then give the piece of sand ready for paint. Like that. And then onto the second piece. So that was alongside the chimney breast. So I know it's got to join up with the first piece like that. So this will be my top edge. So same thing again. Okay, so all of my pieces are now beveled along the top edge and sanded ready for painting. And I've prepared a painting card here just with some masking tape again. And I'm just going to lay these across there like that. 
plenty of room so I can get to the top of each piece. These little pieces just stick on the edge there. And you've got your numbers on the back so you know which is the right edge. And then to paint these, again, I'm just using the mushroom paint, which is the same colour I used for the walls. OK, so I'll just let those dry off for a bit and then I'll give them a second coat. OK, so the paint on the skirting board pieces is now dry and I gave that two coats and then I've just gently sanded each piece. And I'm now going to go and fit that into place and to do that I'm using my Gorilla wood glue. OK, so I've started by laying the pieces along the floor there in order and I've got some glue here which I've dispensed onto some card and as usual I'm using my cocktail stick to apply it. So that's the skirting board in place. I just want to touch up a couple of areas of paint where I've sort of got glue on it. And I only actually realised when I looked back on camera that there is quite a bit of paint on the floor over in that sort of area at the back there. Now that piece there on the left isn't so important because it can't be seen. But I will try and remove that paint there when I clean the tiles at the end. And when you're attaching the skirting board, just make sure that you put a little bit of glue onto the actual mitre join as well. And then if there's any gaps in the joins, like I can see there just at the edge of the surround, um, you can put a little bit of filler in some fine filler and then just paint over that which is what I'm going to do otherwise that looks quite good okay so that's it in the kitchen for now the next job is to fit the um, beams. You might remember me saying I wanted to wait until I'd got the ceiling light, else I think I'll have um, real problems getting the ceiling light into place with that central beam up there. And I was going to try and buy a light at the Tame Doll's House and Miniatures Fair, but unfortunately there really wasn't time for me to do any shopping um, once I'd been round to all the exhibitors and had a chat. So I've got a light on order and it's a six arm black chandelier and it should be with me any day now so as soon as that comes I can fit the beams, fit the light and then we're ready for moving in which is the exciting part. So the kitchen light fitting has finally arrived so let's get this open and have a look. some spare um, candle bulbs in there I really like that it's really delicate some of them can look a little bit chunky now in the um, photograph it actually looked black, like a sort of black um, cast iron, and this is more of a sort of um, pewter almost. And I think that will be a really nice contrast to the kitchen. That arm, I think there at the front maybe looks a little bit um, tilted, but that could have just been where it's been in transit. That's better. 
So it's got quite a long um, chain on it there, so I'll be trimming that down quite a bit because I want it to be fairly close to the ceiling. I don't want it to be hanging too far down into the kitchen. And then it's got the little um, plug fit in there and those pins will go into the eyelet that I've already got in the ceiling. And I'm hoping that this will actually sit inside that beam. I'll try it out first, but if not, I think I could probably just push the wires through and actually take this plastic connector off, but we'll try it first. OK, so I've been having a bit of a think about this over the weekend on how to fit the light and I've slightly changed my mind on how I was going to do it. So because this plastic piece here is too tall to fit inside my beam, the beam is six millimetres high on the inside or quarter of an inch and this is eight millimetres. I was just going to remove this plastic piece altogether and then somehow fit the wire around these pins. But what I'm actually going to do is trim the size of this plastic piece here because it just holds the um, wire to the pins more tightly and more securely. So I'm going to start by removing those two pins using these pliers. And then just very carefully straighten the wires and then pull those through. And then I'm hoping I'm going to be able to do this just with my craft knife. Just move those out of the way. And I want to keep the top part, so the widest part. Um, and I'm going to cut away this bottom piece here. So I'll just have a go with my craft knife and just see how firm the plastic is. Okay, it's actually quite hard, so I'm going to have a go with my mitre cutters. Okay, so I'm using my old set of mitre cutters, um, just in case I damage the blade. I'm just pop that in there. Hold it while I just get the blade through a tiny bit and then I can let go and cut through. And I don't want that piece flying off. There, that was very simple doing it with that. Okay, so now I could just try that in there and that's completely hidden inside the beam, which is what I wanted. So now to put the wire back in. But first of all, I actually want to trim it. So I've got quite a sort of long chain and wire on there. So I'm going to trim the chain and obviously then trim the wire. So I don't want this hanging too far down into the kitchen. I probably want about, let's see, how many links is it? About five links above the top of the light there. So I'm just going to loosen the chain off a bit and I've got a little um, jewellery makers kit here and this really comes in useful for when you're doing sort of smaller, trickier things. Lots of different size and type of plier in there, a pair of tweezers, a cutter. I'm not too sure what this thing is on the end, I've never actually had to use it. <laughs> So what I'm actually going to start by doing is removing the part at the top of the light, this piece here, which will go flush up against the beam. And I actually want to keep that piece. So I'm using these sort of round um, nose pliers. And I'm just using them to open up the top link there. And then I can just unhook the chain. Let's just open them up a little bit more. Like that. And then I want to remove from above the fifth link. So one, two, three, four, five. 
So it's that one there. In fact, I don't think these are going to work. So I've got a little pair of um, sort of cutting pliers here, which have got a nice sh um, sharp pointed tip. So I'm actually just going to cut this, making sure I'm at the right link. And snip through like that. I can then reattach the chain to the top piece. I'll put that in there first. Like that. And then bring this piece down, keeping it on the wire. You can see there's a little hole in there. So that goes through there. Out the other side. And then I can fasten these up. And there's another pair of pliers for doing just that, if I can get them. get into it. There, so just squeeze that together. And then, if you can, just twist it so that the, the join is inside the hole up there. It actually goes into the... inside the plastic there. So that's that, and then I need to trim my wire. And then remember to think about how much of it needs to go through the plastic. So you don't want to cut it right at the top of that piece. So up there like that, and then you want some, um, which we'll peel the plastic away from, to actually wrap around the pins that we'll be putting back in. I'm going to go longer than I think I'll need it, so I'm going to go up there, so probably about three quarters of an inch. And carefully lay your light down, and then I just very carefully want to strip away the casing on the wire. I'll come around that way. So I'll begin by cutting the wire into two splitting it down the middle like that just makes it easier I realised I wasn't even on camera then so I've got into a bit of a better position and all I'm doing is very carefully trimming the plastic away from the copper wire and you need to be really careful here that you don't cut away the actual wire as then you'll need to fit a new piece of um, electrical wire to it. So make sure you've got a nice sharp knife blade in. do that one going away from me. Like Just take a little bit more of the plastic off there. So I may not have enough um, wire there, Let's see if I can get it onto that black so you can see. But I'll do the other one, then I'll give it a go, and then if I need to I can trim more of the plastic case in a way. Let's do the other one as well. You can see on there it was about the same, so it should be okay. Okay, 
So there's both. What he's done there. And then we can feed it back through. Right through the centre like that. And then I'm going to put these pins back in just loosely. And I don't know if you can see there, but there's sort of like a little ridge in the middle that sort of sits on top of here. And then you've got a shorter end and a longer end, and it's the longer end that faces upward. So before you remove your pins, just always make sure you know which way to put them back in. And then you may need a pair of tweezers um, to help you with this part. So I'm going to use these lovely um, narrow tip ones that come in this set. I do sell these in my Etsy shop as well. So sort of separate the wires and then bring the copper wire on one side, making sure you've got all the strands. and twist it around that first pin and then once you're round making sure you're under that ridge you can push the pin back in so push the pin down and then just make sure that the wires are underneath it and then do the other side that one down. Okay, so we're now going to go and try this, see if it works. So it's working. Now when I first plugged it in only three of the bulbs um, were coming on so I thought maybe just one of the wires wasn't tucked in properly so I went back and done that a couple of times but I finally discovered that it was actually that the candles weren't screwed in to the holders fully. So that's a good thing to check if ever you've got sort of random bulbs not working. So I think that looks really pretty. So I don't want to let go of it in case the weight of it pulls it out. Um, but now I can fit the beams. OK, so I've made a start by gluing one beam along the back there, on that side of the ceiling, and then at the front on the opposite side of the ceiling. And then my central beam sits between those two. OK, so I've applied glue to the beam and I've got the light through there. So I'm going to put the light in first. I'm just going to support it and I really want to push that attachment in. So I'm going to use these pliers. Okay, so that was fairly tricky and I couldn't um, film what I was doing because I couldn't get into position. I couldn't get close enough to actually fit it with the camera in the way. Um, but basically I applied glue to the beam and then pushed the light through. And then it was just a case of getting the light into the socket and then pressing the beam into place. And I've just used masking tape to hold it there until the glue was dried because the weight of the light was pulling that down. So I'm just going to um, check the light, make sure it's still working. And if I needed to, I could still remove the beam before the glue has dried but fingers crossed it's working and yes thank goodness it's working so I can now leave that to dry and then tomorrow I'll fit the sort of light that bit there to the beam once I've removed the tape and then I can fit the rest of the beams I'm really pleased with how that looks OK, I'll see you again tomorrow. OK, so it's the next morning now and I'm going to make a start by removing the masking tape.
So I'm now going to carry on um, fitting the beams. And if you remember, I'll be using these um, beam spacers. So the first one on the left hand side there is in place. So I would then just lay that against it, flat against the ceiling, and the next one would go in front of here. Now again, I can't find a suitable camera position so that I can actually film as I'm going along. And I'm sure you don't want to stare at the back of my head for half an hour. So I'll just take some sort of progress pics as I go along. So that's the beams fitted into place and I'm really pleased with how they look. Got a nice um, smooth edge along that front edge there and if you're going to be um, using this in your own doll's house just a few tips. Always work from back to front and if you're using the spacer let the previous beam um, dry off before placing the second one else the spacer will just knock it out of place. And also with the spacer Use it just to get the beam in position and then quickly remove it, otherwise you might find that the glue residue um, gets onto the spacer and then you'll find it more difficult to remove. So my next job is to fit the top part of this light fitting up onto the beam and I've got a little bit of Gorilla Glue left here from fitting the beams, so I'll do that now. Okay, so having held that into place for a good I don't know, 30 to 45 seconds, the Gorilla Wood glue isn't holding it. And I think that's because of the weight um, of the chandelier. So super glue won't work because wood is porous and you can only use super glue on a non-porous surface. So it's onto the strong stuff and the speed epoxy. Now this stuff really smells and you should always um, use it in a well ventilated room so I am working in quite a large um, room and I've got the window open as well so I'm only going to need a tiny tiny amount am I in camera there? let me go back a little bit and just a little tiny dot of that and that's probably even too much the lid like that and the same of this and then you mix them together and they react and that's what creates the strong bond I had a bit of a blockage in that one I sort of had to cut the lid and it just exploded a bit so that explains why there's so much on the card there so I'll just take a little tiny bit of that mix it in with the first part like that and I really do just want a little tiny bit on the cocktail stick and then I just want to dot it just in a couple of places onto the top of the light fit in there Oops. and then press that up and I actually want it to come over a little bit so it's more in the centre and the hole I cut was slightly too large so I'm just having a look around to make sure that I'm covering that at the front and that the gap is at the back where nobody will be able to see it. I'm going to hold this into place and also when you're doing this make sure that the chain is at the front rather than the electrical wire. The smell of this is like ammonia like really really strong um, hair bleach so that's up there now and that won't be completely dry but when it is I'll just give the um, actual fitting part a bit of a buff up and then I'll touch up the um, beam here with a bit more wood dye just because it looks a little bit messy now um, around that area and you can see the shine of the glue which we obviously don't want and then while I was uh, putting the beams in, because they're quite a snug fit, some of the wood dye has come off onto the wall here. So my next job is just to touch up the paint along the tops um, of the walls.
Okay, so another little job I just want to do while I'm here is try and remove that paint from the floor in the corner there. So I've got some white spirit here on a cotton bud. Let's see if I can get that off. Mm, it doesn't appear to be coming off, so I think I may have got glue over paint or something like that. It's not too much of a problem because I can always put something there to hide that from the main view. But there are other, a, a few other little um, splodges that I can get rid of. So now I've got rid of all the sort of paint um, marks, I'm going to give the floor a quick clean. So I've got some warm soapy water here and not washing up liquid that's um just a hand a gentle hand soap and i'm going to be using the non-abrasive part of a sponge or pan scourer i just want to wet the sponge a tiny bit and then just give it a surface clean And then I've got some kitchen towel here, so I'm just going to give it a quick dry and then leave it to dry naturally. And I'm just dabbing that so that the um, tissue doesn't sort of separate and get stuck between the tiles. Now a lot of people are asking me um, if there's a tutorial on this floor in it and I'm afraid there's not because I fitted this long before I even thought about um, doing any YouTube tutorials but it really is quite simple um, time consuming but fairly easy so I just basically started with a cardboard template of the floor and when you're doing that take into consideration um, any sort of door surround pieces that are sticking out and always make the template just a little bit smaller um, and just by a millimetre or so around each edge so that when the tiles are fixed on and it becomes a sort of stiff piece you can still manoeuvre it into the room and this was before I fitted any of the chimney breast or the um, skirting board so do it on your sort of blank floor before you've done anything else and then these tiles, um, this is probably about a full one here, I think they're about two inches by an inch and a half and it's actually real stone and I'll, have, I'll look up some places where you can get them or I'll see if I can actually um, get them at tray to sell in my Etsy shop. And then I just laid, basically laid them out like a, a jigsaw puzzle, gluing them into place as I went. So I think I started over in one corner and then I used some snippers to cut the tiles into pieces. And you just basically build it up and build it up. And then after you've sort of laid out the general shape, you go round and actually cut smaller pieces to size to fill in all the little gaps. And make it really random as well. I mean, we've, we actually had this real stone floor, which I copied um, in this house that we live in, which is actually... Um, a lodge which was built in 1750 and it had this really uneven floor there were lots of little holes between the stones um, and lots of cracks in the stones and they really are completely random that I don't think there were any two tiles that were the same size so you can have a lot of fun with that and do what you want with it so that's why when I accidentally sort of cracked bits off the tiles I didn't mind because that is actually what a real stone floor would look like So there's the kitchen ready for moving in and I love how those beams look they've really sort of brought that ceiling down and give the room a more cozy feel okay so that's it for another episode and I do hope you've enjoyed it I'm really happy with how the kitchen is looking and can't wait to start getting the furniture and then the accessories in so the next kitchen episode will be for the sink unit, I'll be doing a tutorial for that and I'm working on that at the moment, I'm about halfway through. 
So in episode 9 I'm actually going to make a start on clearing out some of the other rooms, so stripping them all back to the bare wood, and I just really want to keep the project moving so that as soon as we finished with the kitchen furniture we can start decorating the other rooms, and I may even start some of the decorating whilst we're still working on the kitchen furniture projects, just really to keep the entire project moving. Um, I know now that my goal of having the doll's house finished this year um, isn't, isn't going to happen, so I've changed that and I'm not really setting a time limit, we'll just keep going, we'll just keep doing it until it's finished um, and I hope you'll enjoy all of the projects along the way. Like I say, I'll be doing tutorials for all of the furniture and all of the accessories. If you did enjoy this video, please do give me a thumbs up and leave a comment as well. I'd love to know what you think about the kitchen so far. And if you're working on a kitchen at the moment, you might like my book, Creating Doll's House Kitchens in 112th Scale. The book includes a range of base and wall units, all of which can be made separately or joined together to make your own fully fitted custom kitchen. And I'll be using some of the techniques from that book when finishing my own doll's house kitchen. Okay, so that's it for now. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you again soon. Bye.